Remember I said X-Men? Originally known historically as the X-Club. What is the X-Club? This is Thomas Huxley. So here we are, the original X-Club, where it all began. Where it all began. Yeah, X-Clan is another way to put it. Who is this guy? This is the father of Julian Huxley. Yes. Julian Huxley. He who coined transhumanism. The original transhumanist. The mere concept of transhumanism. Julian Huxley. Yeah. This is his father. Julian Huxley. But guess who else is included here? Yes. Aldous. Aldous Huxley. The fam bam. Okay. The author of Brave New World. But I would add to that. Also the inventor, or at least the innovator and influencer of the human potential, the human potential movement, which is related to MKUltra, related to Esalon Institute, and this whole 60s CIA, 60s uh, counterculture movement. The, this family alone, these three men are so influential in everything we're experiencing today. Everything. We're most familiar with Aldous, simply through his writings especially Brave New World, Depths of, uh, Doors of Perception, for instance, right? He was one of the, the pioneers of, of the acid trips, which led to the MKUltra acid tests. He was actually a huge part of that whole program. Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand uh, the objectivist, well, uh, that's a whole other conversation. Just her philosophy alone is, is narcissism, so... Uh, objectivism leads to a technocratic, uh, hyper-capitalist society rooted in, in corruption and dominance. But that's another discussion. Julian Huxley, very, very, very influential, a eugenics pioneer as well as a transhumanist pioneer, extreme racist. Uh, Huxley, Aldous Huxley wrote The Doors of Perception. And of course, now we're talking about their father because their father started it all. He started the X Club. Yeah, the X Club. A great book for this. Those interested in um, learning about this, this group is the Ruth Barton work, the X Club, Power and Authority in Victorian Science. These guys, this club, uh, again, uh, Thomas Huxley was also called uh, Darwin's Bulldog. So he, he, in a sense, was a right-hand man, a henchman for Charles Darwin. So you understand that this is where materialism, eugenics, genetic determinism, all of these things stem from. This whole, this whole group here. Now, to add to that, Thomas Huxley was also, uh, I think, the president of the Royal Society in 1883, I believe. Okay, so he's also connected directly to the beginning of scientism by way of the Royal Society. We've done many studies on the Royal Society. That goes all the way back to, of course, Bacon and the Atlantis, New Atlantis, Baconian science, the, the scientific elite, right? And here we are. Here we are with the new X Club. The real X-Men with Elon Musk at the helm. Let's read a little bit about this. This is a nice little excerpt from uh, James C. Ongurinu, PhD historian of science and religion. I just totally butchered that name. Forgive me. He takes a little excerpt from that book. It says, let's see, I pull this out here. It was an irony of which they seemed unaware writes Barton, that the greatest symbolic achievement of the X Club was not the separation of theology from science, because that was a big issue at the time. Is it theological? Is it scientific? Right? It was the whole, it was the whole, uh, almost the height of the Enlightenment era, the, the, the introduction to the progressive era, which is where we got genetic determinism, IQ tests, and of course, eugenics, right? So during this, this time, this was really the, the, the 
emerging scientist, scientistic transhumanist elite faction started here. Now, let's see. The X Club was not the separation of theology from science, but the conflation of science, church, and state in Darwin's burial in Westminster Abbey. Very, very important, guys. Very, very important. In the second paper, Barton rehearses some of the material found in the, pre in the previews paper. What is new and deeply intriguing is her emphasis that X-Club members formed alliances beyond professional science. Who remembers extra scientific organizations we've discussed, not years back, but maybe a year or two ago. Who was that? Ellis, no Ellis Norbert, Norbert, I believe, out of his science, science and technology journals. The Sociology of Science and Technology, I believe, was Ellis Norbert Norton. I can't remember. Anyhow, you guys remember this concept of extra scientific organizations, and I was using that, that work to explain how early on in the 20th century, uh, groups, extra scientific, meaning unscientific, like Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, Carnegie and Mellon, these organizations started to fund scientific research. They started to infiltrate um, um, scientific research and university systems, and they started providing the funding for all projects. But there was a, there was a kicker there. there. There was a catch. The only things that were funded had to do with the political extra scientific, the political perspectives of those funding, say Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, etc. We see the exact same thing today. Nothing's changed. Nothing's new under the sun. I'm just giving you a little bit of the history. So that's exactly what she's describing here when she says beyond professional science. They started to form relationships with banks, with corporations, with churches. Okay? This is why before I was trying to explain to you the connection between the religious man, the culture man, and Ye, the technocrat, the technologist, or the the transhumanist in Musk, but the politician, the businessman, the corporatist in Trump. We are seeing the X Club reintroduced, the real X Men, in my view. Beyond professional science, they formed alliances with German, Germanizing theologians, Christian socialists, humanitarian ethnologists, and liberals associated with John Stuart Mill aligns science with liberal forms in theology and a social policy. Do you see it? Do you see it? That's precisely where we're at now. Let me read that again. I know you guys are putting this together. They formed alliances, scientists, this is, technicians, right? Scientists formed alliances with German, Germanizing theologians, Christian socialists, humanitarian ethnologists and liberal associ and liberal liberals associated with John Stuart Mill aligned science with liberal forms in theology and in social policy hence progressivism this is the beginning of the scientific progressive elite right here historically speaking okay thomas huxley father of aldous and julian huxley See how it all works, okay? And these are just, I'm just taking you through basics. We're not going too deep. These are just basics to understand some historical uh, hallmarks or land, landmarks. Now, let's continue here. Indeed, commitments to naturalistic explanation and to melioristic social reform. Mmm, science for social reform. That's what progressive technocratic uh, policy is, okay? Their goal, the progressive movement's goal was to fix humanity through science. I know technocracy was an early 20s movement, but there's, it's deeper than that. Technocracy is more of a technocratic business movement. It goes, it's, transhumanism is, goes way back, right? I mean, you can go back to 
Leonardo's work and see transhumanism and his early designs. Okay, so I think transhumanism is a mere element of, of human imagination in that we want to merge with, if not machines, say animals. Okay, you guys understand that. Um, commit, commitments to naturalistic explanation and to melioristic so, social reform linked them to these groups. So progressivism is taking transhumanist technologies to fix humanity under the guise of social reform. That's all the progressive movement was. Social reform. But only through technology. We're seeing the same thing today. We're seeing social reform, but more importantly, now we're seeing public health reform through technology. Why? Because there's the body, biology. See, social reform, uh, social ideas, cultural ideas, tend to do with ideas, right? Ideology. So, sound like a, that, 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 that sounded like, a, what's her name right there? Um, has to do with ideology, okay? So it's, it's uh, metaphysical. But see, once you add biology, that's when it becomes physical. That's when it becomes material. This gives you access to bodies. That's the difference. And that's where we're at now. We went from social reform to public health reform through technological intervention. This stuff goes way back. I'm trying to bring you back and showing you some history here. Again, this is an excerpt from the book by Burton. This, is a, this, this piece here is from Chicago University, but this is the book, The Club, The X Club, Power and Authority in Victorian Science by Ruth Barton. Okay, let me continue here. Several books in this area I've been recently paging through include Paul White's Thomas Huxley, uh, Making Man of Science. This is more than another biography of Huxley. It is an account of, what, of the way that a particular cultural identity, the Victorian man of science, was constructed through processes of negotiation and collaboration between naturalists such as Huxley and their families, colleagues, friends, and adversaries. Through a close reading of private, co private correspondences, White builds up a portrait of Huxley and his relationships with his wife, fellow men of science, educational reformers, clergymen, and so on. White provocatively depicts Huxley as a defender of high culture, even as an elitist. So it is my view that Thomas Huxley, though we understand his sons did many huge things technologically and culturally, Aldous more so in literature, uh, Thomas uh, more, more so, well, I guess they both worked in literature, but Thomas more so in, in transhumanist policy. Okay. But what we see in, in Thomas Huxley, their father, he was in a sense, as, as they would put it here, the Victorian man of science, this this new liberal, i.e. progressive, technocrat, i.e. Elon Musk. Let me read a little more. This is from another article. Uh, the British Empire knew that this emerging new paradigm would render both its maritime control of international trade as obsolete as its international program, usury and cash cropping. It was clear that something had to change dramatically, for if the empire could not adapt in response to this new paradigm, a new paradigm shift in science, merging uh, social policy, theology, false theology, and of course, scientism. It surely would not soon perish. The task of reshaping imperial policy from a material force, right? approach of control to a more mental force, this is important. They go from science as a hard science, physical, conclusive, empirical science, to a mental force. Science with a P. P-S-Y. Okay? Where we're at now, we're not dealing with real, hard, material science. We're dealing with mental, uh, uh, socially engineered metaphysical science it's it's weird what it's models and, and projections etc mental force of control was assigned to thomas huxley and the x club this club established the gilding scientific pr principles and this was during the uh the gilded age mind you into the into the progressive era so we go from the gilded age to the progressive era you know the gilded age the age of the aristocracy you know the the robber barons right the big banks the money where, where all of this started to develop started to develop with the x club 
and of course the the royal society and this new scientism that was developed merged with the banking system merged with the corporation the corporate and the science came together and this is before woodrow wilson it makes sense why like say 15 20 years later woodrow wilson pretty much sells out the west to the uh, league of nations which started what we now are referring to as the united nations you see how all of this developed let's continue this group established the gilding scientific principles of empire that were soon put into practice by two new think tanks known as the Fabian Society. Mm -hmm. We've been discussing them for years. And the Rhodes Scholar Trust, Cecil Rhodes, Milner Group, the conservative, quote unquote, right side of technocracy, opposed to the leftist, quote unquote, progressive Fabian side of technocracy. You have the Fabians, progressive. You have the Milner Group, conservative, quote unquote. Same bird, two different wings, pretending to be at war. Nothing new under the sun. Rhodes Scholar Trust, which I outlined in my three part series, Origins of the Deep State North America. Huxley, who was famously known as Darwin's bulldog, for relentless promoting Darwin's theory of natural selection, a Therian, a Therian whose scientific merits he didn't even believe, soon decided that the group should establish a magazine. This is important. I'm going somewhere with this. To promote their propaganda. Do you guys know what that magazine was? I'll tell you here in a second, but that magazine almost uh, single-handedly pushed the entire convid scamdemic propaganda. Let me continue. Founded in 1869, the magazine was called Nature. Hmm. I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with it because we were citing Nature all throughout the past several or at least two and a half years because they were putting out all of the, what some would argue, most scientific takes on the scamdemic. Nature and featured articles by Huxley and several X-Club members, the deeper purpose of the X-Club and its magazine as outlined in a 2013 report entitled Hideous Revolution, the X-Club's Malthusian Revolution, eugenicists, uh, in science was geared towards the redefinition of all branches of science around a statistical empiricist interpretation of the universe which denied the existence of creative reason in mankind or nature, anti-nature anti-mankind. What does this sound like? Sounds like a data-driven epistemology, doesn't it? Yes. Renders all things, nature and man, to computer language. Ones and zeros. Science was converted from the unbounded study and perfectibility of truth to a mathematical sealed science of limits. Eventually, we're going to go all the way into the science of the science of limits and the limits to growth that eventually came out of, of course, Club of Rome. And that's the whole climate change angle. It's all connected, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna be rolling it out for you. It's all here. It's going to take us some time, but we'll get there. Here's a Nature article right here, just as an example. This is the Nature article. This is the Nature magazine, right? Still running full on today. Here we are. CV jabs and safety. What the research says, right? It's experts, right? Experts. Now. I want to show you something rather interesting here to connect even more dots. But instead of Thomas Huxley, now let's go to Aldous, his son. We discussed Julian a couple shows back when we talked about transhumanism and his introduction of UNESCO, which is a technocratic uh, social engineering and eugenesis program as well, connected to UNICEF, which aims for children. Now let's talk about Aldous. Not, we're not going to talk about Brave New World, but I want to show you a letter that he wrote to uh, George Orwell with regard to his work. If you think about it, they, their work was, of course, prescient, but uh, almost, uh, it, there was almost a conflict, a contrast between the two. You know, you have Orwell, who's like, we're going to have this very overbearing, dominant, austere culture, right? Like cell walls type of, of austerity, um, hindrance, uh, limiting, right? Uh, see, Aldous Huxley was a bit different, quite the opposite. Uh, Aldous was like, no, we're going to give people freedom. 
through a, through a, a servitude of comfort. They're going to love pleasure such that we'll provide pleasure through a form of slavery, slavery that they can't even recognize. And many have said, yeah, we're more so in a brave new world. And I agree. But Aldous himself even predicted that and believed it so much he even wrote Orwell a letter. Let's look at the letter. Here's the original. This is off of one of my favorite websites, Internet Archive, just for some evidence, you know, receipts. Okay. So here's the original. Very hard to read. Um, kind of messy. Not very together. Let's, let's go to Gizmodo because they've reproduced it. Okay. I just want to show you the original here. Yes, THX 1138. Yes, definitely one of the earliest ones. That was George Lucas's film project for or project for film school, I believe. Very, very prescient. Very, very telling. One of the one of the good ones. If you want to go back, definitely. Yeah. Now let's look at the letter. Okay, I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, actually, I can. I can read the whole thing. Yeah, it's not too long. Okay. Agreeing with all that critics have written of it, I need to tell you, yet once more, how fine and how profoundly important the book is. May I speak instead of the thing with which the book deals, the ultimate revolution? The first hints of, philo of a philosophy of the ultimate revolution, the revolution which lies beyond politics and economics, and which aims at total subversion of the individual psychology and physiology. Mm, when I think about that, I think of mind and body. I think of social engineering by way of uh, psychological manipulation, but I also think of manipulation physiologically through biotechnology. Let me continue. We're right here. Are to be found in the Marcus de Sade, who regarded himself as the continuator, the consummator of Robes Robespierre and Babeuf. I don't know if I pronounced that right. The philosophy of the ruling minority in 19 1984 is a sadism Okay, hold on. Where am I at here? Okay. Da, 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 da. Sadism, which has been carried to its logical conclusion by going beyond sex and denying it. Whether in actual fact the policy of boot on the face can go on indefinitely seems doubtful. See, Orwell was like, boot on the face is the future. He's like, no, it seems doubtful. My own belief is that the ruling oligarchy will find less arduous and wasteful ways of governing and of satisfying its lust for power. And these ways will resemble those which I described in Brave New World. I have had occasion, I have had occasion recently to take to look into the history of animal magnetism and hypnotism. What do you think social media is? Let's continue. I have looked into the history of animal magnetism and hypnotism and have been greatly struck by the way in which, for 150 years, the world has refused to take serious cognizance of the discoveries of Mesner. Huh, we spent many shows talking about Mesner. Braid, it, that was years ago, but you guys remember. Braid, Esdiel, and the rest. Partly because of the prevailing materialism and partly because of the prevailing respectability, 19th century philosophers and men of science were not willing to investigate the otter facts of psychology for practical men, such as politicians, soldiers, and policemen, to apply in the field of government, governmental, govern mind, right? Psychology. Thanks to the voluntary ignorance of our fathers, the advent of the ultimate revolution was delayed for five or six generations. Another lucky accident was Freud's inability to hypnotize successfully and his consequent disparagement of hypnotism. This delayed the general application of hypnotism to psychiatry for at least 40 years. But now psychoanalysis is being combined with hypnosis. And hypnosis has been made easy and indefinitely extensible through the use of barbiturates, which induce a hypnoid and suggestible state in even the most recalcitrant subjects. Now, if you guys remember my work, um, How Media Shaped the Generations, if we refer to the last installment, narcissi um, 
narcissist narcosis, I go directly into this history of hypnosis and the mind movements of the, of the 70s, which are really just building off of work of Mesner and, say, Freud. So we've been, we've been talking about these things for those who are new. Plenty, plenty of content. Within the next generation, this is where it gets super juicy. Within the next generation, I believe that the world's rulers will discover that infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis, can you say op opiates, right? And narco-hypnosis are more efficient. Also, uh, THC, okay? Cocaine, right? Think about it, guys. ADHD medicines, all of these things are different forms of hypnotic pharmacological powers, right? It's no wonder we see so many young people being given these drugs because they've had these ideas for generations. Hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government. Wow, he's basically saying narcot narcotic hypnosis is more efficient as instruments of government. Now they have social media. They don't need the drugs as much anymore, guys. They really don't. They really don't need the drugs as much. They got social media, which is another form of hypnosis. Telehypnosis. Then clubs and prisons. And that the lust for power can just as completely satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. Mm, there it is. Super modernity is all about fun and pleasure and entertainment. Kicking them into, or should I say, loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. You don't got to kick anybody. You got to flog people. Just give them enough to be joyful and entertained with. Give them sugars. Give them syrups. And give them music, sound, song, and dance. Give them visuals. Give them iconographic imagery to no end that can scroll and roll and float and fly and exist at any time, any place, anywhere, all day, all night, there you have your new mesmerism. Yes, there you have it. In other words, I feel that the nightmare of 19, 1984 is destined to modulate into the nightmare of a world having more resemblance to that which I imagined in Brave New World. The change will be brought about as a result of a felt need for increased efficiency there it is, guys. We harp on it all the time. Make things more efficient through technology. This is why everything's being rendered to number, to quantification, to ones and zeros, to algorithm, to patterns, to predictability. Efficiency. Beyond human nature. Beyond that which mankind and his ill ways, his stumbling blocks, his morality. Right? Morality isn't efficient. It's not. Computers are. Numbers don't lie, right? You can trust the numbers. You can trust the computer, right? Computers don't judge. Meanwhile, of course, there may be a large scale of biological and atomic war. I'm focusing on the biological. Because that's where we at. Bio-war. In which case we shall have nightmares of other and scarcely imaginable kinds. Written by Algis Huxley. To George Orwell in 1949. October, by the way. October, 